Okay, we can uh, we can probably start. So we're just we're going to do a, a session here, uh, looking at the United Airlines format operational flight plan, and Ben is going to talk about that, something that he is quite familiar with uh, in his day to day activities. We have provided a sample plan that you can download from the training channel, and I'd encourage you to do that because it will be referred to during the uh, presentation. I'm just going to hand it over to Ben. He's going to go through the plan a little bit at first and talk a little about some of the sections and perhaps even introduce how he approaches the plan. Then we'll uh, open up for questions. So let's, without further ado, let's let's get going. Alrighty, guys. Today we are going over a uh, very uh, watered-down flight plan for a real-world flight from Chicago to London. Uh, we removed a bunch of filler and some pages that didn't really apply just to get it to just the OFP. Got a couple pictures here as well. Uh, the very first picture is a graphic that is above the six-page OFP, and it highlights the entire route from Chicago to London, and it overlays a bunch of uh, weather information, winds aloft, that whole thing. And that will actually kind of help drive a uh, give you a picture that's going to make sense when we start talking about it down below the OFP. We have it down to essentially nine pages. So page one is actually that graphic. Pages two through seven is the OFP, and then there are additional pages below that we kept in for the discussion today. So we're gonna go down to page two. We start to see the actual text. And the header on it says uh, UAL 958 Operational Flight Plan, page one of six. There's some pertinent information here telling the departure point, the arrival point, the uh, proposed out, off, on, and in times, the equipment uh, that is flying the flight today or on that day is a Boeing 767-300. It's telling you next below wind, where it's grabbing the wind information that's using for, for this flight plan. It's using the 18Z uh, winds on the 15th and the 12Z winds on the 16th. It is telling us in that next block there, you see the 0731 flight time, which is about 23 minutes early on this particular day. You can see there's like, you know, variant 13, rooting, Zulu 1. That's just kind of cool gee whiz stuff. However, it's on release 2. So there was already a release 1 in the system, and there was something that they had to amend, which drove release 2. So this was the most current release at the time of departure. The next block down is discussing what the actual flight is. It's released IFR to London, Echo Golf Lima Lima, or LHR. Down below there, there were some uh, items in the MEL item info, and we chose to redact those. One of them, if you'll see all the time, there's a, an antenna dome that's been added to the fuselage so that people can have their Wi-Fi in flight, and that is always on the paperwork because there's an associated drag penalty associated with that. The next block down... Dispatcher remarks, release two, and this is the reason that we're on release two, was the ETOPS solution was amended. And so that's a, a good remark to know. So if you really wanted to know what the difference was, you would look at release one, look at release two, and see what they changed. And then you can also figure out why they changed it. The next line item here, it's random route north, avoids thunderstorm on the tracks. So if you were to go back up to the graphic, that weather depiction there, there's that blue dashed line kind of an amoeba that is where that thunderstorm area or activity was uh, forecast or during over the atlantic and that is right where the eastbound tracks usually reside so that's why the dispatcher decided to do a random route north to avoid the thunderstorms on the tracks the next note they went with a north departure uh, via taze because they said it was going to be the best to avoid the thunderstorms moving east and southeast of Chicago on departure. So they, instead of just going straight east, like they usually do, over towards Michigan and then hanging a left and heading up northeast, they wanted to go straight north out of O'Hare to avoid thunderstorm activity that was occurring around the Chicagoland area. System info is the next block. Again, via random route north, we're using the 138-minute ETOP solution for this flight. So... The airplane is never more than 138 minutes away from a suitable landing airport is what that is telling us there. This next line, coldest en route fuel temp, not really a big deal. 
especially uh, going across the Atlantic on a shorter duration flight. However, if you're flying something bigger that is going to be a lot longer or going across the polar regions, that fuel temp can be very, very uh, important to reference because as the fuel gets colder, we can worry about the fuel gelling. And the problem is, is that it's not a simple thing to address and mitigate. Yes, you can go ahead and speed up. Yes, you can go ahead and descend down to a lower altitude to try and bring your fuel temp up. But by the time you get the message, it could be a little bit too late. You could actually really run into problems there. So our fuel temp of minus 24 degrees centigrade isn't anywhere close to a limit, but we are going to hit that point at north 5311.3 and west 250.1. We're going to hit it at 7.02 in the morning, 3,354 nautical miles into the flight as planned. Then we have our uh, intermediate alternates and our ETOPS alternates. Our ETOPS alternates tonight were Halifax, Keflavec, and Dublin. And then the last thing here, flight is not en route train limited. That you will not really see unless you're going down south to South America or you're going to uh, Asia or coming out of Asia on uh, like the triple 787. The next block down, routing, we're going to fly a total distance of 3,518 miles. The uh, wind component, the average wind component over the flight today is going to be a tailwind component of 29 knots. The rest of the stuff we've kind of blurred out, redacted, that's kind of proprietary information. Cost index, that's just what the dispatcher came up with for a economy. It gives us on-time performance without using ex any excess gas that we don't need. Planning on being, we're going to go to 330 initially, Traverse City 350. We're going to be at 370. Uh, 57 north 30 west going across the tracks then we're going to drop down to tobit at flight level 190 and stop it at flight level 150 and that is important to reference because the uh, transition level and altitude over in london is down around like 6,000 feet so you maintain flight level all the way down until they give you an altimeter setting when they descend you below 6,000 feet the next box Talking about the FMS initial load, the initial load, if you go ahead and initialize the ACARs, it's going to also populate your flight plan. It's going to have all the legs appear. The first en route fix to the last en route fix are going to auto populate into the uh, flight plan on the FMC when we go ahead and do it. Here's the airport reference plan. We don't really care about that too much. But next below it, the F330 is showing that we're going to initially climb to flight level 330 and the temperature there is going to be minus 43 static air temperature the deviation is plus seven degrees off of isa and the tropopause on that day at that time was going to be up at 443 and we want to reference that because if we spend a lot of time above the tropopause and we don't have ozone filters in the aircraft that can be a little bit of a problem for us top of climb it's going to be Tays plus 51 nautical miles. So after we cross Tays and we go another 51 nautical miles, that's when we're planned to be at 330. And then we step up from there as we continue on. Next is our weights that we're planning on for today's flight. So our zero fuel weight is planned to 268,000 pounds here. Our structural limit is 291,300 pounds. Our takeoff weight is planned to be 362,993 pounds. We'll call it 363,000 pounds. And the limit is 395,983 pounds. And that is based off of our landing weight. So if we were to be up at 395,983, that would get us to our, our maximum landing weight upon arrival into London. As our landing weight is predicted to be 287,000 pounds when we get to London, our struct max structural landing weight is 320,000 pounds. Takeoff parameters over here. The dispatcher is planning runway... 10 left departure, and uh, the temperature they were playing on for this is uh, 22 degrees. The altimeter is 3006. The wind was 2406 knots. Tailwind component of 5 knots, and that is pretty typical of Chicago. Uh, they were planning on a flaps 15, wet runway, and the anti-ice off, and the packs on. And then the landing weight parameters, they are planning on landing on runway 27 right in London. Temperature of 15 degrees. Temperature 3024, wind component of 320 at 10, headwind of 7 knots. Plan on flaps 30, dry anti ice, and engine anti ice on, and the en route. They were saying that they're going to plan on picking up ice on the arrival into London. Next, that block, there's no redispatch point, meaning that there is the ability to conduct the flight and plan it without having to redispatch it. And that 
opens up a whole different can of worms with regards to uh, ETOPS flying and stuff like that. We're not going to go into that today. So the next block starts our fuel ladder. Our intended destination starts off as London. And it says that our burn time to go to London is 7 hours and 31 minutes. And we're going to use basically 76,000 pounds of gas to get there. That's minimum fuel on board. You'll see it down here when we get to plant takeoff fuel when we get down there. So we need that 75,000, 185,000 pounds. We also need our FAR limit of 30 minutes of gas, which equates to about 4,200 pounds of gas. ACF 90, high level thinking, we'll skip it for now. The alternate of, of a uh, Gatwick is going to take 13 minutes to get there, and that's uh, 2,300 pounds of gas. So we need to take 75,985 plus. 4193 plus 2271. We would also take that 2829. It's what we need to kind of absorb any operational delays that may come up or deviations or stuff like that. And that's based off of historical data. That number, we come all the way down. We don't have any additional fuel. We don't have any contingency fuel. We don't have any unusable fuel. That number of 85277 is all of those numbers combined. So that's how we get to main, min takeoff is what we need to fly there, plus our FER, plus ACF fuel, plus alternate fuel, and it comes all the way down. We get that min takeoff uh, number of 85,277. So what that means is that we're going to have, we need to have a minimum of eight hours and 33 minutes of fuel on board before we push the thrust levers up to depart from Chicago for London, which is 85,277 pounds. Next, below that min takeoff is extra. Now, this extra of one hour and five minutes is something that the dispatcher probably put on there. An extra hour and five minutes of fuel, 9,654 pounds. They're carrying that fuel at a penalty, meaning that it is going to negatively impact the economics of the flight. If for some reason that carrying extra gas was in our best interest, instead of saying extra there, it would say ferry and whatever that number is. And so carrying that extra gas, if the line says ferry, is actually not an economic penalty for us. Next is the captain. If the captain were to add any fuel, that would be there. So then we come down, you take the min takeoff plus the extra of 105 and the 9654. We arrive at nine hours and 38 minutes of gas, 94,931 pounds. That is what we're planned to do when we push up the thrust levers. That's what we're planned to have before we take off. Next is taxi fuel, 16 minutes. They're playing a 16 minute taxi out with both engines running. We're going to burn 776 pounds of gas. So you take 94,931 plus 776, we should arrive at 9 hours and 54 minutes of fuel, 95,707 minutes of uh, fuel on board before we push back from the gate. And that is above and beyond what we need to actually minimally complete the flight. The last line here, Rem F, if everything goes according to plan, we push up the thrust levers at 94,932 pounds, you know, as we push it up. We go down the runway and we fly the flight plan perfectly. There are no hiccups. There's nothing that goes wrong with it. We should land in London with two hours and seven minutes of gas, which equates to about 18,947 pounds of uh, fuel, which is what we should land with. Again, taxi and arrive at the gate, we'll probably end up with like 18,800 like pounds or something like that. Below that, you see the CI120 and the CI0. So if we were to run the cost index up higher than what this flight plan was calling for, 220, we would shave off three minutes of, of flight time over the entire flight, but we would burn an additional 974 pounds of gas doing that. If we were to back the cost index off to zero, it would take us four more minutes to get there, but we would save 79 pounds of gas. The uh, local airports and diversions that we have available to us beyond Gatwick are here as well. Those are the airport identifiers, the distance, time, and how much fuel it would take us to get there. Going down to what is page two of six of the OFP, which is page three, uh, you'll see there's, uh, the OFP, there's a bunch of uh, language in here, but basically if you go Boeing 7673 slash hotel, it's a whole bunch of information there. Starting here where it says November 0461, F330. So it's saying we're going to go direct to Rainer, direct to Bartman, direct to Taze, direct to Traverse City, direct to Yankee Victor Oscar. And then we're going to step climb to 350. Then we're going to go direct to Robbie, direct to Janjo, 
Then we're going to go Mach 0.78350 because this is where we start entering the uh, tracks to go into our ETOP area. So that's that's significant, Mach 78350. And then these are the waypoints we have to cross the Atlantic in our ETOPS area. And then after that, you see the uh, Mach 77370 direct to Pickle. That's where we coast in or exit ETOPS. And then that's the, continuing the rest of the uh, flight plan all the way into uh, London, which we're going to do Niagara to the Niagara One Hotel. Then there's just some more stuff in here from the, the uh, dispatcher that we don't really need to concern ourselves with. And then after that, we have what is referred to as our legs information. So these are all of our waypoints. So when I talked about the ACARS and the FMC auto loading and populating the flight plan, it's going to start with Rainer and then it's going to continue with Bartman, Taze, and so on and so forth, all the way down to the very bottom of the OFP where we get Donax should be in there. You can see in there on page three of the OFP, you can see where we have the ETOPS entry point. Two and a half hours into the flight, we still have 2,383 miles to go, and we're entering Gander Domestic at Janjo. And then we have a 56 north, 50 west. And then we have a little block in here where we go ahead and, and input our information that we use off of our class two navigation checklist. Just system checks we do. We check, the, you know, the compass. We check our navigation error off the uh, IRUs and the GPS. Make sure that there's no big discrepancy there. We make sure we have our oceanic clearance, and that's Atlantic only. And that's a, a key thing that happens real world when you get a clearance say, going from California to Hawaii, your oceanic clearance is included with it. So you don't have to get it. Only the Atlantic, crossing the Atlantic, you have to get a separate clearance. HR frequencies. So we like to use CPDLC when we cross the Atlantic. It makes it very easy, very quiet, and actually quite nice. Uh, if for some reason CPL CPDLC is not working or there's issues, then we have to resort to HF. And so we have to communicate our position reports via HF radios because of you need that distance coverage. VHF does not have the range to reach back to land from the aircraft. So we'd write down our primary frequency or secondary frequency. We get a cell call check um, to make sure that it works. And then we flip our comms, our VHF one to, uh, we refer to it as fingers to 123.45 and comm to 121.5. And we monitor those frequencies all the time. Then if we put in any slop, and that is always a good topic of discussion with crews, is are you going to slop and how much are you going to slop? Slop is everybody was on the track and everybody just kept going the same way. Then you could run into each other's wake turbulence or wing to vortices. It can kind of make for a kind of a rough ride. So they want 33% of the traffic that doesn't slop. And then 33% of the traffic that slops one mile right. And then the, the last 33% slops Two mile right, of course. And you always slop to the right. You never slop left. It varies day to day and flight by flight where you go, whether you slop, and if you do, how much you're going to slop. So that's where we enter class two navigation. As we continue going down, we're going across the Atlantic that far north. We don't have a whole lot of time spent in class two navigation. We exit ETOPS right at uh, Pickle, and then we're going to continue on down there. We're going to go ahead and scroll down here to the very end of the uh, OFP, and it says, dispatcher remarks continue from page one. So he ran out of room at the block up, up above, so this is a block they put in at the end here. So he added additional fuel for uh, Chicago thunderstorm delays, delays getting out of there, impossible reroutes, and then he also put in here, turbines likely from Chicago to Traverse City due to the vicinity of the convection activity and the jet stream. So now we go down to uh, the next page of the OFP. So this is where we have like our ETOPS information and this is where it gets kind of critical to, to look at it. So our ETOPS entry airport is Quebec. Our ETOPS exit airport is Dublin. So if we had a problem shortly after we coasted out, we would be turning around and going back to Quebec if we needed to. And if it was after, as we were approaching the end of it, we'd basically go to Dublin. Our actual ETOPS alternates tonight, I said, were Halifax, Keflavik, and Dublin. And you'll see the earliest and latest arrival time for ETOPS alternate airports based on the estimated time of departure. So if we departed on time, the window that we would need the weather to be suitable at Halifax is 0024Z to 0532Z. And for Keflavec, it needed to be suitable between 0254Z and 0602Z. And Dublin would be 0340Z to 0603Z. And so 
our critical point one is uh, north 5611.1, west 4832.8. Fuel remaining at that point is predicted to be 50,800 pounds, and the fuel required to continue from there was 31,074 pounds. So again, we don't need to redispatch. So that is why we are not going to be dispatching this flight. Two engine time from the critical point to alternate at 268 knots at you know Mach 0.485 at flight level 100, 10,000 feet, basically 177 minutes. It's going to take us 177 minutes from that waypoint to get to uh, Halifax. And if we have had the loss an engine, then we'd be flying at 290 knots, Mach 0.52 at 10,000 feet, it's 165 minutes. And below that is just the, the information for going to Halifax versus going to Keflavec, the distance from the critical point one. So critical point one, going turn around, going back to Halifax, 886 miles. And if we have just passed it and we have to continue to Keflavec, it's 900 miles. And then the, the fuel burn that we would have, two engine and single engine going to each respective airport on our uh, ETOPS plan there. So once we pass critical point one, we're no longer going to go back to Halifax. We're going to continue to uh, Keflavec. And you'll see that on a graphic below where those points are. So between critical point one and critical point two, if we have to divert for any reason, we're going to start heading for Keflavec. And that is below here. So fuel remaining at critical point two is predicted to be uh, 31,938 pounds. Required fuel to continue the flight, 15,721 pounds. So again, we're good there. That critical point two is north 56 you know, dot seven west one nine two two dot four. If we have to divert to either airport, it's ninety minutes or eighty four minutes, depending if we're single engine or both engines running. Distance to Keplavik prior to critical point, right at critical point two is four hundred and ninety miles. And after critical point two, going to Dublin is four hundred and eighty one miles. And again, there's the fuel numbers there to continue to either airport. Down below we have uh, winds and temp summary, pages one of two. And this is showing the uh, wind component and temperatures for the various fixes and altitudes along our route of flight, starting at 24,000 feet or 240, going all the way up to 450. Now, granted, we are only going to be concerned with winds at 240, 300, 340, and 390. And you can see that as the uh, descent winds block as well. So that's where we get all that wind information. Now, before we start going to uh, questions, I want you guys to reference picture one, which is out of the uh, Jeppesen app that is used for navigation. I went ahead and took a look at the high altitude chart. You can see the uh, route is overlaid on there. And you can see that I've put in a couple of waypoints. Some of them are, are kind of buried and hidden. It's really hard to see. But you can see critical point one is really easy to see. Uh, it says CP1, uh, basically just south of uh, Greenland is where all the text is. And you can see the arrows. The arrows are pointing to where the actual alternate airports are. Uh, you can see uh, Charlie Yankee Hotel Zulu Halifax with the arrow pointing to it. You can also see EIKF, which the arrow above the critical point is pointing towards it. You can see it's labeled as uh, CP-1, and you can see the lat long for that waypoint there. Farther along the way, you can see uh, CP-2 or critical point 2 with the alternates as well into uh, BIKF and also EIDW, which is Dublin. And then way over at the right, the text actually is buried, but you can kind of make it out to the right, uh, the negative 24 degrees C, and that is the coldest fuel, and that point is buried way over there, basically as you'd be starting your top of the descent going down. So again, not something that we have to reference today. What you will see here as well over the Atlantic is you will see these brown boxes. And that is really depicting either a Gander Oceanic or Shanwick you know, Oceanic airspace. And that changeover between Gander and Shanwick always happens at 30 west. So that's where that nice straight line is there. You'll see that our waypoint is buried in there, north 57, west 30. That waypoint is where we're going to change over from Gander to Shanwick or vice versa. Going on down to the next picture, picture two is the weather overlay. So you can see the route of flight, and then you can see all the various colors and stuff. So there's infrared satellite imagery, there's also radar, and then there's all the cell information. And basically there's a whole lot of information there. What you will see, and what I wanted to point out is there's this red, it's like a rectangle and another rectangle put together. It's 
see straight north of Halifax when you're looking at the picture. That is the area where the thunderstorm activity started on the tracks, and it was basically just east of it. You can see it there, that little blue shaded area, and you can see the flight plan we've taken it north of that area across the Atlantic and avoid all the thunderstorm activity lower in the track. The next picture, we'll call it picture three. This is another app that uh, has a bunch of information useful to the pilots. This is called SkyPath, and this is measuring turbulence from other aircraft that are using the same application. And it shows all the airplanes that are, are all the uh, flights that are using it as they're crossing the Atlantic or even over the United States. You can see that there. There's a scale, and it shows that the green is light turbulence, yellow kind of moderate, orange is moderate, kind of getting a little bit more moderate. And then there's red, which is, you know, severe turbulence. Uh, the next uh, image, image four, is the exact same thing. However, it's pulled up profile view. So it has where the turbulence is reported relative to the planned altitude for the flight as well. So you can see that it, it's kind of hard to see, but buried back over towards the left of the scale under O'Hare is that line climbing up. You can see there's a bunch of uh, yellow and orange dots there, and that is light to moderate turbulence being reported in the climb out. As we're climbing up through, we're going to be expected to get that kind of a ride. So that is a quick overview of all the information that is here. Regarding setting up the uh, FMC, when you get into the airplane, usually it's powered up on ground power because maintenance has had to come out and do the ETOPS functionality check. So sometimes it's on ground power, sometimes it's on the APU. But regardless, it's always powered up. They may or may not have aligned the IRUs. They may be aligning the IRUs or have them in NAV. So we have to go ahead and align it. When we jump into the FMC to start programming it, one of the first steps we do, because most of the work is programming the box. We're going to start at the init ref page. We're going to go ahead and make sure that we have the valid position information entered there. The next step, I do the init thing and I go to the ACARS, tell the ACARS to initialize because that does a whole bunch of stuff in the background that starts like importing the flight plan and getting everything set up. I jump back over to the uh, FMC side and then on the uh, perf for the performance page, I go ahead and start inputting stuff. So the information that I grab from the OFP to put in there first is I grab the zero fuel weight, the plan zero weight of 268,000 pounds. I will put in the zero fuel weight line L3 on the perf page. And then the other information I will put in there is my reserve fuel. So my reserve number, most crews will take the REM F number, which down below is 18,947 pounds, and we'll subtract 2,000 pounds off of it. So that would be 16,900. Uh, we could just round it up to 17, so they just nice, nice round even number. So then I put my, my reserve fuel number at 17,000 pounds. And then the other two blocks that I'm going to put in there is the Initial cruise altitude of 330, which is R2, I believe it is. And then the cost index, which, again, we blurred it out for this. But that number right there, we would put, and I believe that is R1. Then the next thing I'm going to do is drop down into the uh, fixed page. If I needed to add anything in there, departing out of Chicago, we usually you have to reference uh, GCO. And you can just put it the rings in there. And then I go up to the route Verify that the route loaded correctly, and then you should the time it's there. So I'm going to load the route, execute it, then it populates all the legs. So I'm going to go and check all of the legs that are there. And while I'm in there, I'm going to go ahead and try and load the wind data. And it's important that you load the wind data before you load any departures or arrivals because the, uh, the technology on the 7678 uh, FMC is a little dated and it struggles with big computations. So we go to the legs page before we load any departures or arrivals. We're going to go ahead and do a route data. Then we input the wind. And all we do is we just go the log that was down below, which I said was 240, 300, 340, and 390. Then we go ahead and follow the prompts to get to execute. We wait for that information to come back. That information is going to come back in a prompt. We're going to load it, execute it, and then we're going to get an FMC com that says, hey, we have descent winds as well that we can load. So we go ahead and load those. After that has been done, after the wind data has been loaded, then we can go ahead and input departure or departure runways and STIDs and arrival runways and STARS and approaches. So then I would do uh, departure arrival. I'm going to select, uh, in this case, 10 left. And there is no uh, STID out of Chicago that we'd have to select. I'm going to go ahead and insert it, execute it. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the same for London. 
Then after I do that, if you were to follow the flow on the FMC, the next button below departure arrival is hold. At that point in time, that is a, a memory tool for us to hold. There's nothing else we need to do in the box right now. We need to start doing other stuff like we're going to do the overhead panel. We're going to go do the walk around, you know, whatever it is. Then we come back in and then we can start con continuing on with it. So ATC P on the FMC is where we would go ahead and log in to get our clearance or uh, log into CPDLC if we're in an area that has CPDLC coverage. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and jump into the cars and we're going to start pulling uh, takeoff data. And that is just something that we do. We grab just a generic one and we just go, hey, we're going to depart off of this runway from this intersection, grab it. And it's going to come back with something. We don't want to confuse it with anything. We don't want to add any information to it. We want it to come back because when we send that request, it's going to grab the most up-to-date weight information and it's going to come back with what should be the closest final number that we're going to arrive at without actually having our final number. Uh, then we're going to go set our speeds, reference all that, and then we basically are getting ready to run checklists to get off of the gate. Very good. So uh, we've got a number of questions here, so we'll move on to that. Uh, the first question from Nathaniel. How does one uh, input uh, into the FMS uh, into the ETOPS information? The ETOPS information. So I believe what you were asking with that question is maybe the critical points and or the alternates. So what you would do is you would have the entire flight plan in there. And then what you would do is you'd go down to the very end of the flight plan and you would just put in some fix that is not anywhere near the flight plan, not to be confused with it's not on the flight plan. Most of us that leave out of Chicago and go to London will use uh, like GCO or we'll use like Badger, you know, IIU or something way back in the States before we even, you know, get there. And that's just to create a point in there. Then what we do is we go down to our critical points that are here, so our lat longs. So what we're going to do is we create what's called the dog bone. And what we want to do is we want to have it extend both north and south of the critical point. So we would take that north 5611.1, and we would go north one degree and south one degree. So we would go north 5511.1, west 4832.8, and we would input that waypoint into below, like say, we're going to stick with GCO. And then I would take north... 57, 11.9, west, 48.32.8, put that as well, and put that there and go execute, and it would go ahead and actually draw two fixes out in the middle of nowhere that are crossing where my critical point is. And I would do it again for any other critical points I have. So critical point two, north 56, I would go north, north 5700.7, west 1922.4, and I'd go below it one degree, so I'd go north 55, 00 0 0.7, so on and so forth, and put it in there. And I, I'd also put, put another waypoint between it so that there's discontinuities there because you don't want any lines connected to it. And when you do it that way, it will not actually throw off your fuel plant. So when you go check your progress, you will not see any drastic change in your fuel plan or predicted fuel. So it doesn't make you go, oh my God, I'm running out of gas. Um, and then as we cross the waypoints, we just get rid of them. Some people get rid of them. Some people don't. That is the question as to how to go ahead and put the or how do you put the critical points in there. As for the actual alternates, if you wanted to code the alternates, go to the init ref page, and then there's an alternate page. And when you pull it up, it pulls up four alternate airports that are there. You can hard code your alternate airports in there. So for the first one, I would hard code uh, Charlie Yankee Hotel Zulu and Bravo India Kilo Foxtrot, and I would code them in there. And then after we pat critical point one, going to critical point two, as we approach critical point two, I would take out Charlie Yankee Hotel Zulu, and I would go, you know, just BIKF. And then after that, BIKF, and I would add a EIDW. There's other stuff that you can do. There's a limitation with specific airframes as to how far you can draw, but you can draw a ring off of your alternate airport as well. So you could go into the uh, fixed page. You could put your hard code your airport in there, and you can put a distance ring around it. it basically draw a big circle. I believe the limit is 411 nautical miles on the 767. Don't really use it all that much. Haven't seen a lot of guys that use it, but that is another thing that you can do for situational awareness. And I hope that that answers your question, Nathaniel. Next question is from Roger. He comments that the UVA flight releases provide a passenger count 
would it be possible to also have the system generate a cargo freight number as well? Now we've talked a little bit about this before. The uh, pilot really just sees a, uh, a zero fuel weight uh, rather than it being broken down, but perhaps you can just comment on that uh, further. As a real world pilot, I really don't concern myself with the cargo freight number. All I really care about is my zero fuel weight and my final weight so I can get my trim settings and you know my configurations and stuff like that. So while I can understand why you may want to have that, it's not really something that a real world pilot would concern themselves with. Moving on, Tim, who makes the determination of when to swap and how much? Is it Oceanic or company? So it is neither Oceanic nor is it company. It is up to each individual flight crew to determine how much they slop. You can't flop until you're in Oceanic airspace, which is called, uh, you know, basically the Orca is what we call it. You can't slop until you're there, and you have to remove the slop before you exit Class 2 navigation. Again, it's up to each individual pilot. So what I do is I take a look at what's around me. So let's like, say, for instance, I'm leading the pack at 350. There's nobody in front of me, and there's no the people maybe behind me or something like that. And they may be above me, they may be below me. And I'll be looking at TCAS when I make this determination. So I will probably go ahead and not slop because then I get the person behind me an opportunity to eat slop or not slop. Now, if the wind is safe, for instance, it's coming from the right, so I have a crosswind coming from the right, then I may go ahead and slop out to the right one mile or two miles, depending on what I want. And the reason for that is if anybody comes from behind me and above me, that's going faster than me. As we continue traveling that way, their weight turbulence could go ahead and it, well, it's going to descend and it could descend to my flight path and it could lead to a, a crummy ride. Each time of crossing and entering the uh, class two navigation, it just depends on the weather scenario, traffic around and stuff like that as to if you're going to slop, how much you're going to slop. And then obviously when you do it, you can't do it until you're in class two navigation and you have to remove slop before you exit class two navigation. Tim, your next question. Enrit winds, from what I understand, top climb winds are used for init ref and use average wind for the first waypoint after top climb. What is mandatory for the data? Does United have uplink feature to get all the winds for each waypoint? The answer is yes, they do. And that goes back to what I was talking about. When you go ahead or doing the wind uplink, that will go ahead and it, it calculates all the winds for each individual waypoint that is on the flight plan in the box as it's going. We don't use like an average wind component. That's more of a flight plan. Thing that's there but everything is is basically it does a calculation it figures it out between the altitude that we're at and the fix that we're at okay next question from uh, arian uh, how can i determine my plan trip fuel on the pmtg 737 based on the uh, ofp also how to calculate reserves okay for that i would encourage you if you're not using it already or have not set it up that you go ahead, start utilizing SimBrief. The SimBrief has the ability to check the United Airlines 2018 OFP format, and that will go ahead and take care of um, a lot of your questions regarding that. However, the easiest thing, if, you're, if you want to just go basic ballpark numbers, and uh, I see that Danny has joined the group, so Danny could probably chime in as well on this. The average fuel burn on the 737 per hour comes out to 6,000 pounds an hour. So if you're going to be flying a flight that is going to three hours, you need at least 18,000 pounds of gas for that flight. Then a nice buffer or reserve is usually another hour of gas. So add another 6,000 pounds of gas. So that would be a quick and dirty way of getting to how much fuel you need for your, your trip and then your uh, reserves. Basically, reserve gas is always going to be about 6,000 pounds on the 737 to get a full hour of reserve. And some questions about cargo loading, weight at stations, and so on. Okay, so what you guys are talking about, you're, you're trying to figure out what your cargo number or baggage number should be for setting up the weight and balance on your aircraft. The easiest thing to do, and I've seen it with most of the, the aircraft models that are out there, it has the ability to basically input a zero fuel weight, and I would encourage you to Focus on that more than anything else. That way you're not figuring out, oh, I have to get so many passengers in this zone, so many passengers in this zone, and so many bags in this zone, or so much weight in this cargo compartment, so much weight in this cargo compartment. Just go ahead and take a look at what your zero fuel weight is on your OFP that you get, whether you get it from Simbrief or wherever you get it. Take your zero fuel weight. In this case, like I said, 268. I would round up 268.1. So 268.1, drop it in the zero fuel weight. Either go ahead and 
set your fuel in the FMC how you want it to be set, or go ahead and if you're using like any add-on that allows you to bring up the fuel, you know. And then when you're all set and done, you should be up around what your planned takeoff weight is on the OFP, and that should take care of that. I think that will make it easier for everybody. Okay, next question from Tim. How soon before the flight do you arrive at the airport? So uh, we have two different parameters that we have. Uh, we have if you're carrying origination or if it's like a downrange flight. And then on top of that, we also have if you're domestic or you're international. So for a day one, starting the trip, domestic uh, segment, go time is an hour prior to go time. So if the flight's supposed to leave at 9 a.m., we have to be at the airport by 8 a.m. at the latest. And then after that, it drops down to 45 minutes thereafter for everything except for uh, international partners. And then it's a full hour. Now, on day one of an international departure, it is a full hour and a half to give us an extra half hour to meet go over everything because there's a lot more involved with an international flight than just, hey, we're going to go to Des Moines, you know, kind of a thing. And a question from Ethan. Uh, how long are layovers to Europe? I'm sure it depends, but curious uh, on how trips work for long hauls. Um, so most European overnights are in the 24-hour range or more. Lately, I have been doing, yeah, like 20, 24, just a little over 24-hour overnights in London. And when I've gone to Dublin, which is my favorite one to do, I get a 48-hour and 15-minute overnight in Dublin. So that is uh, a lot of fun there. It just kind of depends on the schedule, and it depends on uh, holidays. Because uh, the Europeans like to completely shut down, where they don't have any service, any airplanes to park on certain days of the year. So that also factors into how long the overnight is there. While we're waiting for some more typing, uh, perhaps you could just comment on an interesting flight plan you might have seen in the past or something interesting on a plan that you don't generally see. So in regards to the interesting flight plan, we had flights where we were trying to go down to uh, Orlando out of Chicago, and we went way west over Iowa and down you know, Kansas and like come around the back way across the Gulf and stuff like that to get into Orlando to avoid uh, – weather or really really crummy rides and it's funny because you look at it and you're like oh mike's gonna add a whole bunch of time to it and we ended up getting in five minutes behind scheduled departure time and we departed one minute late go figure another one that was really kind of a gotcha it was uh, the dispatcher had planned us we were going uh, chicago to uh, tucson and this is on the airbus they had us planned came up with the fuel plan and everything else and we took off and there was an area of turbulence and we were supposed to be able to climb above it well, the problem was coming out of Chicago is they, they held us low. They kind of step climb you. They're very hands-on coming into and out of Chicago. We were unable to be above the area of turbulence before we hit it. And we were running out of performance to the point that we weren't going to be able to make it to get to our – well, we weren't going to be able to get to our altitude. And since we weren't able to get to our altitude, we were going to burn more gas. And, well, since we were burning more gas, we did not have enough gas to make it to our destination. So we already started the discussion. Well, where do we go? captain had wanted to drop into Albuquerque, and I said, hey, we're going to go right by Denver. Why don't we drop in there? Because if for some reason we, we land and something breaks on the airplane, at least we have people there that can fix it so that we don't really screw over the passengers. And so we ended up doing that, and that was uh, a way that the flight plan kind of fell apart on us because what the dispatcher had filed <laughs> and what we were able to accomplish and achieve did not uh, mat mesh that day. Next is a question uh, from Vincenzo. At this time, is there any app that can handle in real world all the Oceanics plotting tasks electronically? Yeah. So flight planning, uh, it's a system. It's not just software. I mean, it is software, but it's a system. It takes a look at a whole bunch of, of uh, functions in regards to going from point A to point B. It goes, okay, what's the best route to get there? What's the fastest way to get there? What's the shortest way to get there? What's the most economical way of getting there? And then it analyzes all three of those, and it comes up with a solution that then the dispatcher can go ahead and analyze and go, well, you missed this, and so we're going to go ahead and kind of drive the solution a different way. Well, we're coming up to uh, five minutes uh, to the hour, so approaching that hour that we had uh, committed to. Uh, we'll see if any more questions come in. But I just, at this point, I just want to thank you for your time and, and spending that time with us and and going over your understanding of the uh, flight plan uh, uh, and how, how it pertains to uh, virtual flying in particular. Yeah, my pleasure. Like I said, it's, it's kind of fun when you can bring 
real world information and apply it to sim flying because it's, it's amazing how far some of the simulation stuff has come. I know like PMDG does a really good job prior to Phoenix FS labs. It was a good job with their, their was kind of a thing. And I, I do have the uh, Phoenix. I haven't had a chance to really play around with it yet. I just know I don't have enough time to sit down to do it yet. Another question from Tim. Uh, do you run it by company before making a decision to divert? Yeah, you have to. So every real world 121 flight at the end of the day, yes, the captain is the ultimate authority and responsibility to the conduct of the flight. However, the dispatcher on the ground shares a responsibility for that flight. So if we have to divert for any reason, or if there's anything going on with the, the flight itself, the company needs to know. The company needs to find out via dispatch. Everything goes to dispatch, no matter what. So if we're doing like an ETC relay, or if we're doing a cell call patch, doing an air ink call, that all gets routed to the dispatch department first before it can go anywhere else in the company. And if we are sending an ACARS message, it's the same thing. We have the ability to do what's called, a, a, we jokingly refer to it as like the phone a friend kind of a thing. So as you're going across the Atlantic, you can see, like say for instance, I might notice that there's a, an airplane out in front of me that's uh, 2,000 feet above me on the same track, but they're way out in front of me and I'm getting a kind of a bumpy ride and I can sit there and send them a message go, hey, how's your ride there? If for some reason they're not on the radio. And we used to, it's uh, you know, basically like you're CCing somebody. Well, we always thought that that went directly to that ACARS. Well, no, it actually goes through dispatch first. So you have to kind of watch what you say because, you know, there are other eyes that see it before it gets to that. So anyways, everything has to go to the company before any decisions can, can truly be made. Now, say, for instance, you're over the Atlantic, you lose an engine or you have an engine, you know, quit on you or a medical emergency or something like that. You go ahead and you actually start doing what you need to do, knowing that you're going to divert, and you go ahead to make sure that you include the dispatcher. I hope that that kind of answers your question, but yes, we have to let the dispatch know that we are diverting or that we are thinking of diverting. Okay, so we'll get another question out of the wire here. During the summer, do you fire up the APU right away to get the AC going, or are air carts common? The uh, ground air carts that we have... Some of them work great, some of them don't. Some of them are actually inconfigured uh, incorrectly by our ground crew. Sometimes they have it just on fan or vent when we need the full AC. Or say, for instance, it was cold overnight in some of our uh, mountain stations, so they had it on heat and they forgot to switch it, and now it's the middle of the day and it's hot, uh, so we need AC. So it, it varies. If you get on the aircraft and it's uncomfortable, then we go ahead and we start taking over the responsibilities of it. If it's not, then we like to try and save gas as much as possible, and we'll just let the air cart do its job. So as long as the air cart is doing the job that we expect it to do, no, we don't just get on and crank the AP right away. Uh, right. Yeah, air cart is pretty standard starting off pretty much anywhere. Uh, in fact, the uh, ground crews at our hubs are really good about getting the, uh, for sure, the external power hooked up so we can shut down the engines and the APU and stuff like that. And then they're also really good at hooking up the ground air. Now, there are some instances we have where we try and mitigate risk, and that's what we're all about doing. So when we start getting into high wind situations, they they want to limit stuff that is near and around aircraft and also connected to it. So I believe it's when we get to stage two, which stage two winds, uh, we start uh, using extra chalk, and we also start limiting what we are connecting to the aircraft unless it's absolutely necessary. So uh, Danny's chiming in here, all right? Uh, so on like a stage two day, we might not connect external air. We might not connect external power just because we don't want like any wind or something like that blowing something into it and then pulling on that hose or that cord and damaging any of the receptacles on the aircraft. That's the reason for that. So then in that case, yes, we would be running the APU and uh, so on and so forth. But yes, uh, in your sim world, in the sim world, you're going to probably be able to get away with using the uh, external power GPU and external air pretty much all the time, and then you're good to go. Question about uh, shenanigans on guard. Yes, unfortunately, there are, are immature individuals out there that love to tie up guard. But but you can always count on Delta to be the guard police. Okay, okay hold on real quick. So the funniest <laughs> exchange ever was um, I was flying, and the center controller asked me, and he goes, hey, you know, I can't remember what the flight number was. He goes, can you do me a favor? And I'm like, sure. And he goes, hey, can you go on guard and look for this aircraft? And my response to the center controller was, and I quote, I'm sorry, center, I thought only Delta could talk on guard. And we all laughed. Nice, that's a good one. Yeah, it's 
for for those to to bring this into context um there is someone messing around on guard almost all of the time and inevitably someone from delta always chimes in and says knock it off or uh, grow up um anyway so it's kind of the running joke of the industry that delta is known for being the guard police of course they may be also the ones that are, are causing the infractions right, right. <laughs> yeah well we still have some questions uh, coming in so with your indulgence Legally allowed to side chat on 2345. Um, so that really only applies when you're out over the water. And it's funny, if you actually look it up in the FARs, there is a dedicated air-to-air -air frequency, and it is not fingers or 12345. Um, that's just the accepted one for being out over the water that we all seem to use now. So, yeah, you can side chat on it. I did it on a flight one time. We were coming back from London. And we saw this guy behind us, above us. He was a thousand feet above us. And we were we were talking about it. And you talk about slop. So we were one right of a uh, course slop. We were slop one right because the wind were coming out of the uh, north northwest. And this guy was behind us, a thousand feet above us. And we kind of said, "I'm kind of creeping up on us." And I was talking with the other guy because I was the pilot flying. And I was like, "Hey, when he gets up over here, if he comes over right over the top of us, I think we should go out to the right." another mile so slop to right so that we can avoid any descending wake turbulence well right as he got up to us he went to right and i saw him out the right window and it was a, a snooper it was a british airways a380 which that's the mean wake turbulence there so we ended up looking it up to see what flight number it was and we asked him we go hey you guys just passed you seven six and he goes yeah we did We're like hey do you guys mind uh flopping back to the left a little bit and we'll go out to the right you know, we were having a brief exchange with them, but yeah, he was asking, he's like, oh, did you guys get any wake? We'll go, no, but we want to get out to the right to avoid it. You know, and he's like, oh, yeah, not a problem. So we watched him, and he did it. He went past right. We basically did a swap. He went from two right to one right, and we went from one right to two right, and it just happened right in front of us. And then um, we continued chatting with him because we were, you know, surprised to see the A380 coming back, you know, and so we we're chatting with him about it and stuff like that. So, yeah, there was a little bit of chatting going on there. Yeah, see, that's it. Yeah, we were worried about the wake turbulence. And so as we continued on, we were still talking with him a little bit. And for those of you that are not conspiracy theorists, we'll, we'll joke about it. So he had the chemtrails on in full effect, and we could see it. And you could see it coming out nice, nice and well-defined, and then you saw it flatten out and start to curve. Well, we were watching it, and we were kind of eyeballing it. When he got about 18 miles out in front of us, you could look out the left side, and his uh, contrails or chemtrails were right at our altitude. So it was about 18 miles out in front of us. If we would have been basically right in his wake turbulence, which on the E3 is is not fun, so I've heard. I really don't want to to, to verify that. I just want to take people's word for it. So as the wind shift it kind of changes your your slop philosophy, at least for me, it does. So I think we could probably wrap up. Do you have any closing remarks uh, about anything? Uh... Uh, the only closing remarks I have is uh, there are quite a few real world airline pilots here. So there's a, a whole host of knowledge that's here and available. And yes, I know that some of your interactions with us are where we go ahead and basically are grading you and, and judging you and stuff like that. But that is one small facet of our, our interaction here. Passing on knowledge, making it easier, answering questions so that you can go ahead and, and I guess operate more realistically or better. That is what we are here for. So by all means, ask questions. I know that Danny and I monitor quite a bit. It's just a matter of our schedules. I mean, most of the time, as of late, I've been, I mean, I did that, a 10 day stretch where all I did was cross the Atlantic for 10 days straight. And I had no idea if the sun was going up or coming down. So I was a little bit out of commission there for a while. But suffice to say, the training staff here is very well equipped to help answer questions, steer you in the right direction. And we're here to help you have more fun with what you're doing here, I guess is the best way to say it. And fun is what it's all about. Um, I, is it, if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. Well, that, that's, that's my hierarchy. And then I'd also like to mention that we're our, our next uh, teaching session, which will be about two weeks, we'll be announcing it shortly. Uh, Rich Federko, who is uh, Airlines Tower Controller at Denver, uh, will be presenting a session. There was some interest about the operations of, of that on the chat list, so uh, don't don't miss that. That'll be a couple weeks uh, Similar format, he'll, he'll chat a little bit and then uh, open it up to, uh, to questions. Okay, well, that was, that was great. I guess that's a wrap. You guys take care.
All righty. Again, any other questions, you can go ahead and drop them in here, and one of us will see it and we'll try and answer as best we can. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.